Welcome to Halal Money Matters. I'm Christopher Patton. I'm Monim Salam. Ramadan Mubarak, Monim. Yeah, Ramadan Kareem. It's been, it's been an entire year. It's crazy. Uh, we started the podcast last year right after Ramadan, and now we're into Ramadan. It's, 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 been, it's been a wild ride. Yeah, and I, I still have not seen you in person in quite some time. Exactly. <laughs> but any, any day now, any day now. <laughs> any day, any day. We, we thought about this idea. Chris, I don't know if you've ever spent iftar. You know, we do one at the company every year, but, mm-hmm. you know, there's usually a lot of food and that gets consumed in Ramadan, but not only that, but water and other things like that. So we thought, you know what, let's talk a little bit about the economics of it, since this is a halal money matter show. Yeah, and not just kind of the economic behaviors of individuals or of companies up and down, like all kinds of questions. We have a great guest, Rafi Dinshiko is from Dinar Standards. They've done a lot of work on, and surveys and really understand the uh, OIC market really well. Mm. And so I'm really excited to talk to him. All right, let's talk to him. I'm excited. Before we jump in, a couple of terms you're going to hear in this episode. One you're going to hear a lot is the OIC, which is the Organization for Islamic Cooperation. And that is an international organization consisting of 57 member states. And the other one you hear a bit later on is GCC, the Gulf Cooperation Council. And that's a political and economic alliance of six member states in the Middle East. All right, we're here with Rafidine Shiko of Dinar Standard. So just to start out, I think we want to learn a little bit more about you. So uh, why don't you tell us something about what the kind of work Dinar Standard does and kind of how you ended up in that field? Sure. Uh, first of all, Monim and Chris, thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure uh, to talk to you guys. Um, and we've been uh, Monim good friends for a while, so it's good to catch up as well. Um, uh, thanks for that question. So the North Standard uh, is a labor of love. Uh, it's something I always had a passion to uh, start and build a venture myself. So uh, had that fire in the belly of, you know, as, as many entrepreneurs do, to, to do and build something myself. Uh, uh, a short, short background to why the North Standard and what the North Standard, uh, it really has a link to September 11. Uh, in the sense that as a professional uh, spending most of my adult life in the U.S., uh, originally coming from Pakistan, growing up in the Middle East and Oman, and had come to the States for my higher education and settled and uh, did my MBA and uh, was working in Boston, uh, first in North Carolina, where I did my master's uh, or my MBA at UNC Charlotte, then moved to Boston, worked for a strategy consulting firm. Um, and then, uh, and, and it was uh, there that uh, 9-11 had happened. Uh, by that time, I had been immersed in really working with Fortune 500 companies. And my job before that in North Carolina was with, actually with a sports management firm. I was doing marketing for a sports uh, media consulting firm so met some superstars that i personally didn't know i wasn't like that enamored with uh, and, and some of those exciting names now are peyton manning and archie manning and so uh, dan jansen and some of these guys so so um uh, you know given me being a immigrant at that time wasn't really uh, that much into knowing the personalities, but later on I caught on and realized how cool it was to hang out or know Peyton, uh, which I know all of you would uh, certainly recognize. Um, but anyway, I digress. Uh, so I moved to uh, uh, Boston and um, worked in strategy consulting. So basically built an experience in strategy and especially e-electronic strategy, e-business strategy, work with uh, Fortune 500 companies, saw how you build a brand from zero to multi-billion dollar brands. And then 9-11 happened and, you know, it was kind of, um, uh, I, I, I also lost my job in Boston, moved to New York and worked for a company called Marsh McLennan. They had their offices in the tower and they had lost a lot of, I think the most number of employees that were lost in, 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 in that attack. And I actually uh, was recruited in to replace someone uh, who was who had lost? So you know, it was also very. It got very personal, in the sense of the you know the the fact that I was hired by that firm and and you know felt this real real strong uh, concern about the role of Muslims and Islam in the world, and what has our contribution been? Uh, 
uh, during that time was my uh, this urge to do something and link it to this question of how what is the role of Muslims in the world and my observation as a strategy consultant was when I looked at the Muslim world I, I was surprised by an observation which is that when you look at the top 100 global brands or innovations none of them were from any of the Muslim majority countries and that uh, was a bit uh, that was shocking and that didn't make sense because here you have about a quarter of the world's population with a diversity of resources you know oil to agriculture to talented people and yet in this past century there's really nothing of significant that this part of the world has contributed to the global economy so so this question along with the belief in our in, in the islamic ethos and values that Islam is good for the world, and Muslims are, have underlying good values that are uh, strong contributors. So how does that, how does it equate to the fact that we've not really been contributing? Uh, however, what gave me confidence is the legacy has been very strong. So you know, up until the golden age of Islam, around 13th century, some of the biggest scientists, and even even when you talk about business concepts and so forth, or medicine, uh, Muslims were f at the forefront. Of it. So, so anyway, so so it seemed like there's something that was that must be uniquely uh, challenging to this part of the world, and that's the question on the basis of which I started in our standard. First of all, as an online business magazine, now I map that question with my background, which was private sector business and really uh, focusing not on this question academically. But looking at the business landscape, like I said, there are no global brands because I, I'm a marketer by heart and by profession. And uh, so when I started this question of no global brands, so it was really coming from that point of view. So Dinar Sarna started 2000, uh, December 2004, did the first ever ranking of top 100 businesses that are domiciled are from the Muslim majority countries. So the 57 OIC member countries every, you know, and there are 57 countries that form this um, multilateral body called OIC, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, a lot of the uh, Af uh, North African, Sub-Saharan African countries, the Middle East, GCC, uh, Turkey, etc. So out of that, I did a ranking of top 100 companies and that ranking in the first edition got into the Economist magazine. So they did a whole page because it seemed like, to my surprise, again, no one had explored this question of what is the economic profile of these countries beyond the oil and gas picture that everybody knows about. So just out of curiosity, so was this done on uh, top 100 on market capitalization or no, by revenues revenue. or how did you do it? By, revenue. revenue. okay. by revenues. And what was unique there was, and again, I spend a lot of time, uh, given my background experience, I wanted to do it rigorously, uh, modeled around Fortune 500. So for, when you look at Fortune ranking, it's done based on revenue. Yeah. And so now the challenge with OIC countries was you have a lot of the companies or corporates that are not listed or uh, it's hard to actually it's, it's quite opaque right so and monem you know that very well um uh, so what i did is in that ranking included government owned government linked enterprises or privately owned for whom some level of reliable revenue data was available again the point was to give a view into these markets that no one had uh, because if you just included publicly listed companies from these countries, you would really not get, uh, you know, you'd maybe get 10% of the picture. Uh, so, so I ended up, I did end up getting, um, and what was fascinating about that top 100 was, yes, the top 10 to 11 were national oil, uh, oil, um, oil companies starting from Saudi Aramco, or uh, the UAE and Libya and uh, Iran oil and all of these oil companies, but the rest of the 85 to 90 were the fascinating, brought out the fascinating picture that there is actually strong domestic economic activity, you know, and, and some of the big segments were financial services. So the, uh, a lot of financial institutions were on the top 100 list. You had a lot of retail conglomerates you had a lot of airlines, so Emirates, Turkish Airlines, Qatar, Etihad, they were also in the top 100. Then you had uh, 
a lot of telecom players on there as well at the slot and so forth. And these are the threshold of that top 100 was at the first year we did the ranking was I think 1.6 billion in annual revenue. So you have now here a list of top 100 enterprises with quite a diverse, a diverse list. So the criteria was, it was not Sharia compliance, by the way, Monim. I mean, very interestingly, we had Genting Berhad from Malaysia on our list. That's right. And, and that that caused a bit of a stir. I got, you know, how can you have, you know, and, and I, my response was, uh, this is a reflection of what companies exist from OIC countries. And all we were doing was saying, these are the companies that are domiciled from OIC in the top 100. Just so you know, Genting uh, is a, uh, it's like a casino company in Malaysia. Okay. And, and, and you probably know that Malaysia, although it's majority Muslim, there's a fairly large about between about 40% of the population is non-Muslim. Mm. They're either Hindu or, or, or Buddhist, Chinese, and Christian. Mm. So, you know, you, they, they actually do quite well because they own properties not only in Malaysia, but also in other countries in Southeast Asia as well. So. Well, and if, when you push out a list like that, I mean, you're generating a conversation, even if some people are like, how is this on there? You're, they, I mean, you're just, you're starting a conversation that needs to happen. That's correct. Absolutely. And the first few years I did this and what had happened is it really helped build solid original research on these markets. It's been now 12 years since uh, I've been on this journey. Now, uh, the NAR standard is a, I'd say, you know, uh, I'm quite humble, but at least within the Islamic economy space, we're quite well recognized because of our thought leadership. We're now engaged with providing uh, advisory work to sovereign wealth funds in the region, to private equity funds, to government agencies, vis-a-vis uh, -vis economic policies around leveraging this wider OIC opportunity as well as the global halal economy opportunity and um the NAR standard also has has always and now also in our advisory work uh we are good at also general global innovation work because if i talk about the, the original uh, purpose of starting the NAR standard which is where are global brands from this part of the world uh it's not just about islamic economy uh given that uh, given that original intent it's about how do you actually bring innovation and what's holding back, for example, Monem in Malaysia, Proton, right? That's the big story of how do you build indigenous competitiveness? How do you build in Turkey, Olkar, into trying Olkar, which is a, a Turkish brand, a uh, confectionery brand, Chris, that has bought Godiva, or Proton in Malaysia, which is an auto manufacturer, they bought uh, Lotus in UK, from a knowledge transfer, technology transfer point of view, but yet they're not able to break through into into being a global brand. I mean, as big of as big as foodies Muslims are, right? We're really uh, the Muslim of the world. They're really proud of their. We in the top 100 food companies. There's not one food company from any of these countries. Now something is off. It doesn't make sense. So, so I think this is where Dinar Standard is really uniquely placed. And, and in a way, the nature of these countries is these are developing economies. So a lot of our competency is now how do you enable developing or emerging economies uh, you know, from Africa, from Asia, from Central Asia to really break through and compete at a global level. With digital transformation, this is something that's happening fast. And, and you know, we're, we're excited about where we're taking Dinar Standard forward. That's really great. Uh, yeah, and there's a couple of things you mentioned that I think we're kind of uh, tying back into uh, this discussion, which you mentioned the Islamic economy and you mentioned foodie. And so, yes. you know, and, and you cannot talk about Ramadan without talking about food, either the absence of during the day or the abundance of at night. And so the topic really that we wanted to talk about today was really about, uh, you know, the, the impact or the Ramadan economics, if you want to call it, right? And what, sure. what I mean by that is what happens in, in, in the Muslim world, but also in Muslim minority societies within the U.S. or U.K., that type of thing, that's fairly unique uh, economically, you know, when, when, you know, when it comes to Ramadan. And so I wanted to kind of throw that out there first and, and see what your thoughts were on that. But really, before I do that, I have to ask, man, are you still in touch with Peyton Manning? <laughs> you know, the funny story there was I actually went to pick Archie Manning from the airport, and it, this was my... Uh, you know, I was fresh out of MBA program. I had no idea who he was. I mean, I, I picked him at the airport and I didn't ask him. Like, I wasn't at all uh, in awe or anything. So he's like, oh, you don't know who I am, right? And I said, yes, 
Should I? And he's like, no, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's uh, fun. Yeah, so regarding, so what, what initial thoughts on Ramadan uh, economics, you know, what, what kind of unique oh. features are there uh, in, in, in the Islamic economy when it comes to Ramadan? So, I, so one thing, let me just kind of, uh, you know, being an analyst or a consultant, uh, I'll throw some figures out to contextualize. So you have, we have around 1.9 billion Muslims uh, uh, today around the world. It is one of the youngest demographics in the world. So the average age, I believe, is in low, uh, or is in 30s, whereas in uh, Europe, it's uh, high 40s. Um, and average world is also quite high. So it's a young population. And you know, you always hear about this, Monem, across these countries, the demographic dividend, right, of, of these uh, countries, uh, the young, the, 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 the crisis that governments have, how will you find jobs for the youth, so forth. So anyway, so 1.9 billion Muslims, a lot of them young. Uh, and food, when it comes to food, uh, interesting statistic is, our estimate, and we this is part of our work on the Islamic economy sizing, is uh, last year our estimate of $1.17 trillion is how much Muslims spent on food. This is approximately 17% of the global consumption of food. And you may be surprised, Chris, at least, that the top five, top out of the top 10 exporters of food to Muslim-majority countries, top nine are non-Muslim-majority countries. So the number one exporter of halal products in the world today is guess who as a country? Australia. Can't be the United States. It sure is. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So U.S. and France and Brazil, uh, India, uh, Russia, these. And when I say halal products, more name, I'm including pharma and cosmetic, but bulk of it is food. Um, so non-OIC countries, so, so what it means is it's, it's when it comes to halal food or Ramadan food, it's part of the global supply chain. There is this drink called, and Mona may, may or may not know in the GCC, and I'll link now to Ramadan, called Vimto. Have you heard of the brand Vimto? I have. Chris, Chris probably hasn't, but I have not. Uh, it's a UK-based brand. It's kind of like, yeah, it's one of the well-known brands in UK. 50% of their revenue in a year comes during Ramadan wow. from sales in the GCC alone. Wow. So, so because it's become the staple drink in GCC when you break your fast. So 50% of their revenue uh, in a year roughly comes from uh, the month of Ramadan, one month. Right. So do you like so, do in the, in the culture is that you take a date and then a Vimto? Is that, is that kind of the idea? That's right. So, you know, wow. exactly. So date, Wimto. Wimto is part of the uh, breaking of the fast, uh, very, very popular among the, uh, among the GCC local population. And that's a great example to, your, to start uh, commenting on your question, which is the linkage of the global supply chain of food and its impact on Ramadan. And, and this example is not just one example. The whole supply chain worldwide, if you can imagine, like I said, if if majority of the two uh, of the 1.17 trillion consumed is coming from the rest of the world or a big bulk, it means the rest of the world has a stake in uh, what happened in terms of Muslims' food habit. And Ramadan is a big one, right? And like with this example of Vimto, like I said. So, uh, you know, countries such as Brazil, they're national economies get shaken up if there's a halal related scandal which recently happened meaning uh, something um, uh, a scandal of trust in terms of halal compliance of meat being exported uh, today brazil is the biggest exporter of chicken to the muslim world and it's so big that it has a huge impact on brazil's overall economy where one scandal and it hits the economy hard and you have the president and the top diplomats coming and engaging at a diplomatic level to try to resolve it. So, so first at a macro level, um, Monem, you know, Ramadan has a significant economic impact to the, uh, to the flow of food supply worldwide. I think because I guess you have to kind of point. prepare for it right after Ramadan's over for the next year. Because you have to have all the shipping lanes and the, and everything all Absolutely. prepared, especially for Vimto, fifty percent of their of their of their Absolutely. monies are coming from there. It's almost like a, a retail space in the U.S. Uh, 
between Thanksgiving and New Year's. Absolutely. And, and so. in that case of Vimto, then what, what's happened, I mean, it's been happening a, a long time, is that they have a huge manufacturing facility now within at Saudi, in Saudi Arabia, I believe, in the region. So you have a lot of those players who will set up domestic manufacturing, which is something, which is another side note. And, you know, in, in this conversation, we, we have to talk about COVID and, and its implications also going forward. Um, but in general, uh, at a macro level, yes, there is that, uh, the, uh, you know, to start with. Of course, uh, you know, we, 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 it would behoove me not to hone in and talk about the individual level. You know, ultimately, uh, fasting is a very personal um, endeavor uh, and, and yeah. Ramadan, and it starts, it starts there, right? So it's, it starts from the, the virtue of Ramadan at an individual level. Uh, uh, there's so much good that comes during this Ramadan and we feel it, right? So collectively as communities, we feel the good that it brings. And one of the big virtues of uh, the Ramadan at a personal level is giving, right? So as you know, the charitable giving uh, also exponentially, I mean, again, uh, we work, for example, for the UN, United Nations Human Commission for Refugees. And they have recently, uh, last uh, about two or year, three years ago, they've launched a zakat fund, which we helped uh, them launch. And Ramadan is the biggest season, quote unquote, if I can call it a season, but biggest time when people give uh, the, the amount of charitable giving by Muslims. This is the time of the year when the most giving happens. You know, we have our good friends at uh, Launch Good, crowdfunding platform for social good uh, with a lot of charitable giving to Muslim community related uh, projects. And uh, I know Ramadan is a huge thing for all of these uh, philanthropic activities. So, so on a macro level, how does uh, the, the, the pickup and charity uh, affect the economies? Um, it's, and have you seen anything? And now you've been doing this, mashallah, for like oh, what, a good 12, 15 years, um, and you have data going back, you know, that uh, that far probably on on different statistics in the OIC. So, has there is there an impact, so one way or another? Uh, you know, I can I can think of multiple examples just on an economic level, where um, you know you have maybe you have food inflation uh, because people are trying to buy the products right, right away. If, even even if you're trying to donate mm -hmm. the, uh, the 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 food. You have to buy the food first, right? So then mm -hmm. you can talk about that. You can talk about, you know, are there some areas of consumer discretionary that fall in Ramadan? You know, those type of things. Do you have any, uh, can you shed some light on that? Sure. Uh, exactly 10 years ago, we did a, a major study on the impact of, uh, uh, the impact on the economies of OIC during Ramadan, as well as uh, Muslims, professional productivity and, and impact on their professional lives during Ramadan. And, and that report still gets quoted, even though it's, it's dated. So one of the things we evaluated was at a macro level, as, as you asked first, Monam, is how does, has, does Ramadan have a positive or negative impact on the economies in a macro sense? Is there any sure. correlation? Is there any correlation, right? And interestingly, there's been some... Um, other empirical studies done that have looked at the stock market performances in OIC. So there are about, I'd say about um, 28 some uh, stock exchanges within OIC markets. And, and we ourselves for that work had done a, a, an analysis of, is there any correlation of the month of Ramadan? Because, you know, as you know, the month of Ramadan also shifts every year, right? So we could kind of ascertain that there is or not any correlation. And interestingly, there was some correlation, and it was at that time, for the most part, positive correlation, i.e. Ramadan actually had an uptick in investment activity within OIC countries. Now, in the stock markets know, particularly. Stock markets particularly. So you're looking now. at fund flows, you're looking at fund flows in, and you're looking at whether the rise or there's a rise and fall, correct? We're just, pre just looking at the rise and fall. Okay. Which, which you know, reflect is reflected in. Fund. We're just looking at the rise and fall of the, um, the the stock exchanges market value and and its performance uh, year on year during the period that is Ramadan across the geographies. Well, on the aggregate, you're saying that the, if you look at the OIC markets, they're usually up, but on a on a on a on a country wide level, 
it could be up or down, right? Yes. Um, yeah. But do, what what do you attribute that to? Is that it's that uh, like a consumer sentiment? Uh, people just feeling better about Ramadan, so they 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 invest more, or is there something else yes. that's fundamentally going on? Yes, I mean, I, I this has been a question we've always had because there isn't, you know, you can attribute philanthropic giving to Ramadan because it makes sense, right? I mean, that's just clear, no brainer. You can attribute certain categories of products, food in particular, uh, growing, and 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 that makes sense, right? Um, and and uh, you know, just like during COVID, we got to understand the importance of essentials, right? We really understood what essentials are, and and you saw uh, uh, as across sectors into 2020, while the markets dropped, and we did in our latest global Islamic economy report, where we cover other sectors, food, clothing, uh, cosmetics, media, finance, of course, uh, pharma, and travel. Um, and just as the rest of the economies around the world, excuse me, pretty much every sector got hit, but we know food and, and many segments within food actually were up and as you know, uh, online retailing was was up. Uh, entertainment was up, right? I mean, during COVID time, certain segments benefited, and you know all the stories of the digital platforms like Zoom and so forth. So even in context of Ramadan, you have certain sectors that you know you would imagine would do well. Amonem to the point about how do you how do you answer if if in people were investing more. Uh, maybe certain sectors are performing better, but it it seemed like it went beyond just those sectors of food uh, and and directly linked. So there 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 has to be some something to say about yes, feeling good and investing uh, more or uh, you know trusting or or um, and and in general as you know there is a general ethos uh, within Islamic tradition of not just sitting on your money and making your money be productive. So maybe something to that as well. I'm glad you mentioned the report because I was looking at it and looking at it and you talked about how it's broken out into sectors. And one of the sectors is media. And I noticed that in the report, it refers to Ramadan as arguably the most important month for media companies in Muslim consumer markets. And I wondered if you could kind of talk about that a little bit, the why and kind of how that manifests. Sure. So uh, absolutely. I mean, media goes crazy. Uh, during Ramadan. In fact, you know, just like you'd have special Christmas specials or uh, Thanksgiving specials, I mean, you have major, uh, in, in the Arab world, it's called, the word is Musal Salat. So you have special drama serials that are created, 30-day serials for Ramadan. And these are multi-million dollar productions that go, you know, uh, they, they become huge hits. And they have the themes of Ramadan in it. You know, sometimes they're family topics, sometimes they're heritage topics. One of the very well-known ones, uh, Monem, you may know, a few years ago called Omar, uh, which was an Arabic serial. And it just went crazy successful. There was a $50 million media production, a TV serial, and um, produced just for Ramadan. So you have the same uh, concept in Indonesia, which is one of the, which is the largest Muslim population. Uh, in the world, and they have special serials and so forth. You have a whole media ecosystem. You have musicians that uh, do, you know, just as you have Christian music, you have Muslim music. So you have these superstars. Uh, uh, there's a company out of UK called Awakening uh, that has uh, branded brands now, stars uh, that do Muslim uh, 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 music, you could say, and content, there are superstars. I mean, you're talking about a billion plus uh, views on their uh, videos. Uh, Maher Zain is a name uh, uh, and many others. And they are not just popular within English. I mean, they're popular across OIC countries and, you know, GCC, you have these young folks, so forth. You have them in uh, Indonesia, Malaysia. But what's interesting, Chris, within media, so first of all, that. Second, media spending, and, and this links Monem to your point about does buying go up? Because I guess people shop more uh, during that time. I mean, you have a little bit more time. So uh, certainly a lot of marketing, you know, across OIC or Muslim majority countries, you'll see a lot of, I mean, to a certain extent, it's actually sad. I mean, well, you know, just like people um, 
don't like Christmas being so commercialized, which it is, right? Uh, and uh, and it's a little bit of that has happened to Ramadan as well. Uh, anecdotally, I'd say maybe not to that extent, but it's 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 getting there. Uh, I mean, so I, I think have... you're, I think you're right. That's a, that's a good point because when I was in Malaysia, I mean, there was this commercialization of of the month, right? But it's really it was my the first time I was experiencing it because it was the first time I was out of the U.S. in a Muslim majority country. I, I don't I don't feel as much of that Ramadan commercialization in the U.S. or amongst I don't, I don't know I can't speak to Europe or other Muslim minority countries, but you definitely don't see it. Uh, in 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 the U.S. as much as you do, and it's growing every year. You know, as as people realize, oh, I can actually make money. More people will begin to do it. It's just like a chain reaction yeah. that, that actually happens. Yeah. So I, I, actually, I think you know because obviously you're in a Muslim majority country. It's it's visible anyway. I mean, of course, if you yeah. come to Dubai during Ramadan, everything is Ramadan, right? Every billboard has a Ramadan thing, much like you'd have you know Christmas carols playing all around you during Christmas time and so forth. So, I mean, same thing here, schools to malls to offices. I mean, Ramadan, Ramadan everywhere, and then Eid, which is the celebration time. But I think even U.S., uh, Monem, I mean, you 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 should know, uh, or you would know as well, that a lot of U.S.-based product launches, you know, I know we have a small community, and when you talk about Muslim products ecosystem, but Ramadan is is the milestone. So I know entrepreneurs within the within the Muslim community on on propositions towards Muslim community will plan the whole year for launch pre Ramadan because that is the time to launch your mm -hmm. proposition and 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 because you know the whole community is focused and you get the attention. But you're right. You don't see you know you don't see luxury products being uh, up. I mean here of course in Muslim majority countries everything is. From you know you have, uh, you'll have uh, Dolce Gabbana having a Ramadan campaign. Yeah. So, but in U.S., Dolce Gabbana doesn't need to. I mean, they're not yeah. targeting the Muslim market. Exactly. So, but but the Muslim community propositions are so you know from fintech, financial services to halal products. I mean, you'll see a lot of new product launches happening mm. around around time to Ramadan actually. Yeah. So even though so so let's kind of break down a little bit more. So even though like for example. You know, we're not consuming any anything uh, between sunrise and sunset, right? Do you find yeah. that the, the 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 consumption or the the demand for food and and drink actually is higher in Ramadan? Uh, yes, yes. I mean, you know, I think uh, as you know here, I mean, it's it's again, it's. A I mean, on a macro level, right? It's on, I mean, it's, if you say it's higher, I, on a macro, I think it's uh, counterintuitive, basically. To think that yeah you know. no i i think it is high uh and, okay. and i think facts facts support that which is because people f specifically food food is the thing that you buy a lot during ramadan because yeah. you're buying it for your not just the breaking of the fast everything between breaking of the fast and your morning when you start you know where your fast starts people are as you know they'll have a post uh break of fast late night eating yeah. i mean uh here in dubai there's actually, you know, you have Ramadan tents that start at like 9 p.m. and they'll go to midnight or 1 a.m. And it's basically buffet set up. Every company will set their Ramadan uh, tent up for a certain time period, one or two nights. And it's just there's a lot of food going around. And and hopefully the, there is a lot of good happening as well. You'll see, you know, you're on the street and people are just coming out and companies will just have food that they're giving away for breaking out the fast, making sure. Uh, all the mosques are, you know, have their own breaking of the fast. So everyone, I mean, Ramadan, I would say nobody goes hungry uh, yeah. because people are in the in the giving mode. So uh, even if you, you know, we'll all share with the neighbors and send the iftar or make sure no, you know, any poor on the street is taken. And, it, and I'm not just talking about Dubai, you know, if you like countries like Pakistan or low income countries, uh, Egypt and others, you know, Ramadan is a very... You know, it's it's just about feasts. So food, yeah. yeah, I would say yes. So so then what? So Maybe, put yeah. it an obvious one, right? But I, I was thinking about this as we're so maybe some some uh, uh, outliers, those the different different knock on effects that that Ramadan has. Maybe you can talk a little bit about what is one area that you looked at and said, oh, that's interesting. That went up. I would have never realized it. So so again, you know, when we talk about Muslim and Muslim behavior and and these questions. The uh, when you and, and you, I mean you have to account for the fact that you're talking about 1.9 billion people uh, spread across the world. 
you know, all the way from China, which has, you know, a significant over at a minimum over 20 million uh, people to Russia having roughly around that number of Muslims to, you know, the, the, the norm, you know, the, the known countries to, uh, you know, South Africa or even uh, South America, Poland, Europe, etc. So, so the reason I bring this up is there is so much diversity that that answer is very diverse. And, and uh, if you break out at the very aggregate level, at least at the minimum OIC countries, and non-Muslim majority or uh, uh, country, uh, Muslim populations uh, such as U.S., U.K., France, Germany, etc. Um, uh, there is also a difference in terms of the uh, in terms of what goes up and what goes down. Now, let me kind of share with you an, an example. If you look at OIC countries, and again, uh, Chris, uh, or these are the Muslim majority countries where governments, you know, the government level do practice. Ramadan is an official thing, right? And so you have national holidays. So what we looked at, interestingly, was the effect of how different OIC countries, their, their policies on office hours and its effect on productivity. That was a fascinating mm. effect analysis. You know? So you have uh, the Gulf countries, the GCC, which is the uh, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Oman, and so forth, which on average give, gave the highest reduction in office hours official officially so government offices and then private sector follows as well and there becomes a culture where for example in saudi you know you basically have a uh, instead of eight you have a five hour working day right whereas in indonesia there is no reduction of hours they basically just move the clock up one hour so the working t time starts early and ends early no change now so there is, there would be, you know, there is a theological question of is that needed, is that really needed? And we did a survey along with that in these different markets, and and really, do people utilize that time off to do more of the prayers, or they're just going home and sleeping and preparing for food and all of that? And I think it's it's the it's it's, it's the latter. I mean, um, there isn't really at an aggregate level uh, a huge need to reduce our work hours. And as you know, um, one of the ethos there is Ramadan, uh, we're supposed to fast in, 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 and keep our normal day normal. So it's not like, oh, it's Ramadan, I have to take the month off, I can't work because it's gonna be so hard. Oh my God, I can't have any water, any food. Uh, this is, you know, I need to sleep half day or, or whatever rest, no. You're supposed to have your normal average day and fast, right? So I think, um, so that was a fascinating study, uh, as, assessment in that study, which was there were a lot of the OIC countries where the official hours are reduced. And, um, and we, we derived, this was a self-assessment, we derived, and I have this up so I can mention that it has a roughly a 4% impact on the month's GDP per hour of work reduction per day. So if you calculated those countries that were cutting the hours, that translates, if, and, and there, if, if each hour is a unit of productivity, as a country, you lose roughly 4% of the GDP per, uh, per hour of work. So per hour of the reduction, it was equal to 4% reduction in GDP. Just in that um, month or for the year? For that month, which, which is, you know, and again, we, we just kind of, uh, kind of work backward from, uh, uh, an hour uh, a day of reduction, and how does that translate to productivity? Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, so, so I think this is something at a policy level. And when we did that, we did get you know a national level attention uh, where this this was covered in media as a topic in different countries as a result. But but this is this was interesting where you see in Indonesia and Malaysia where either there's very little uh, reduction or they just kind of move the time to a lot mm -hmm. of other countries that are, uh, uh, you know, having a reduction in time and um, not really finding increase in spiritual time being utilized. It's uh, uh, on, on, on that hour saved or two hours saved per day. Um, what about, uh, you know, an industry that you would, have, you would have not expected to go down or go up? It would be interesting to find out whether or not alcohol consumption went down in Ramadan. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> right? Oh, okay. So, uh, All right. Yeah, Noted. So, I, mean, I will. Uh, I'll put that on our research agenda <laughs> as a potential <laughs> survey question next time around. Because it's a, it's 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 a double face, right? It's like you, you would think no, it would say the same, but you're like, wait a minute, Muslims drink also, so they might not drink in Ramadan, so it might go down. You know that type of thing. So I don't know. But but you know something like that, like in in Dubai, for example, where it's pretty much a free for all for anybody can go drink or do whatever they want. Um, would would it actually go down or not? So. Yeah, but you know, as as you know, here in Dubai and and, and countries where alcohol is like, in, particularly in Dubai, you are actually not allowed to serve, or or it's oh. um, it's it's closed. Uh, I mean, they they separate it and and they don't serve alcohol. Uh, like you know, on religious days, you cannot even those places that usually would serve alcohol, they will not serve. They're not allowed to serve alcohol. So I think they they do have some controls there uh, or, okay. or some official. Uh, laws there but sure. yeah that's an interesting question yeah I, I think your general point is the outliers or the unexpected you know for yeah. example luxury goods as an example yeah. what you know uh, cars automobile sales i mean does automobile sales go up during ramadan and and if so why you know what, yeah. what is that i guess they have to run to the mosque five times so you know they, they need their fast cars i guess exactly i don't know <laughs> well it will so it all ties into eid gifts as well, because the Eid gifts are usually That's bought right. in Ramadan, right? So that that could be a, a portion. But That's right. Giving of, of gifts and buying of new clothes as as one of the one of the traits or, or characteristics. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then just one 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 last point when you when you talk about Ramadan marketing, right? Um, and and the media going up and those type the media spends. What is the general theme of marketing when it comes to that? So, for example, what what I mean by that is like. Messaging, yeah. What's the messaging? Is, yeah. is it spiritually tied to the product, or is it, uh, you know, how how is the messaging done so yeah. that people are encouraged to spend in Ramadan? Yeah, uh, I think again, it's it's quite diverse to the market, and, okay. and at the minimum, in Muslim majority countries, where everything, like, so every, you know, Ramadan is all around you. So I think the the general messaging. In, in a lot of the Muslim majority countries would be around families getting together. You'll see a lot of feel good families getting together, having a meal together, which is, you know, part of the ethos and, and one of the good, uh, one of the beautiful things of Ramadan, you know, the families get together, have their break, breaking of the fast, the elders. So you see a lot of uh, humility being shown. You see a lot of themes around charitable giving. Everyone emphasizes how they're the importance of taking care of people. So you see that in the messaging and the branding, a lot of the branding. Um, I remember back to US, um, uh, you'd know a very good brand, successful American Muslim brand called Saffron Roads uh, with our good friend Adnan Durrani. Mm -hmm. Saffron Road is a halal food brand, which is, and in fact, majority of its customers are not Muslims because of its high quality of healthy and ethical um, ethical branding and sustainability focus because uh, ultimately when we talk about halal food it's really about eth uh, ethical uh, food uh, practices right how an animal is treated what is it's being fed and um the uh, and of course the notion of how an animal is um, prepared much like kosher but it goes beyond it has very strong sustainability and ethical angles so saffron roads when it launched uh, Whole Foods, it became one of the most successful pro new product launches for Whole Foods. And early in, in its launch, there was a lot of backlash, an Islamophobic backlash to, I mean, this became, a, this was national. I, if, I don't know if you remember the controversy with better, what's the turkey? Butterball. Turkey, butterball, right. So Butterball, it, it was found was actually halal in U.S. And there was a big backlash on it. Oh, man, I should have um, known that 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, yeah, we all were like, whoa, we didn't know. Exactly. So it yeah, was exactly. because of, it, it, but the, because they were exporting it to Muslim sure. And they're like, you know, if we're kind of making it, who cares? You know, even in U.S., there would be a lot. So there was a big backlash on that. And so Adnan's product also had hit with a similar backlash. Whole Food doubled down on their Ramadan campaign supporting Saffron Roads. And at the end came out saying the sales actually went up by 300% off Saffron Roads in Whole Foods. So that was, what a great testament to number one, an American brand supporting 
a, a halal product, and which was not just halal, it was sustainable, ethical, it was just all around a good, wholesome, healthy, sustainable product, uh, but really supporting and, and going against the risk of yeah. uh, the Islamophobic reaction, who asked for boycotting Whole Foods, and there, it was on CNN and all, I think this was a you know, four or five years ago. Um, similar story happened with Campbell's Soup uh, out of Canada and Canada, and, and they also kind of came back and supported it. So so I think messaging wise, one of the things is, you know, within US, and we've done some advisory work for brands in US is, you don't necessarily need to make it a national, uh, a national campaign, rather to do it very targeted, focused, community specific campaign yeah, makes sense uh, so you don't need to have an ad in usa today saying happy ramadan although i think that was a great thing it should happen but you know just from a risk management reputational risk management point of view and we see that in a lot of european companies because we do advisory work for brands in france for example uh, where there is a very strong sort of uh, first of all uh, over 10 percent of the population now is muslim in france very strong uh, halal products or products that are uh, geared towards Muslim communities there, but um, you know there is a strong reputational risk to the mainstream brands there, so they're very hesitant. So the messaging has to be you know smart, uh, and I think in U.S. Uh, probably still needs to be you know a bit smart that way. But when you come to Dubai or Malaysia, you know it's all it's like Christmas, right? So, and and you really bring all aspects and flavors and and the good that uh, Ramadan has. So, yeah, it does. Any final thoughts, uh, Rafi, that you have? Uh... I think the um, you know the the question of economic effects of fasting. Um, I feel in in as in in these times of post pandemic or or us still in a pandemic, but but slowly coming out of it, I think the, the excitement of Ramadan is even more so. I, you know, I, I feel it within my friend's circle and friends and family really looking forward to Ramadan. And it's the, you know, I think people have been humbled by the experience of the pandemic. And Ramadan, I expect a lot more giving. Uh, I think eating will still happen, will continue and all of those things. But I think the giving and philanthropic part. Number one is needed. There's a lot more, as you know, people uh, in dire situations, uh, poverty levels have gone around across the world, including in US, uh, up. Um, and I think one of the e economic effects of fasting is the good it brings to the, to the downtrodden. And, um, you know, I think um, this Ramadan will be super important for that. From that point of view. Yeah, I, I I hope so too because um, you know and it, if it'll be if it it's a really significant year over year increase. Uh, last year, anecdotally from the charities that I work with, they they had a banner. I mean, the, one of the best years they ever had was last year in Ramadan. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you know, if we have it, you know, even go up from there, even that's even better. That, that would be great to do. That. Exactly. You know, we work like I said with UNHCR and there's a God Fund and all, various philanthropic programs. They've they've exactly they've had they're all everyone I know of has said they've had the best year. Yeah. Which is uh, which is good and Ramadan only you know is a is a big boost. Uh, that's true. For them. Alhamdulillah. Great. Thank, Thank you very you. much, uh, Rafi, for, uh, for for joining us. Thank you. Uh, it was really a pleasure having you and uh, and and hopefully we'll have you on again for. For, for another segment uh, sometime in the future. My pleasure. Thanks, yeah. guys. Thanks, Monam. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, man. Chris. Good to meet you. Please consider an investment's objectives, risks, charges, and expenses carefully before investing. To obtain this and other important information about the Amana Funds in a current prospectus or summary prospectus, please visit amanafunds.com or call toll-free 1-800-728-8762. Please read the prospectus or summary prospectus carefully before investing. The Amana Funds are distributed by Saturna Brokerage Services, member FINRA and SIPC, and a wholly owned subsidiary of Saturna Capital, the investment advisor to the Amana Funds. Saturna Brokerage Services is not affiliated with Dinar Standard. 
Investing involves risk, including the risk that you could lose money. The Amana Funds restrict investments to those companies consistent with Islamic and sustainable principles, which limits opportunities and may affect performance. This material is for general information only and is not a research report or commentary on any investment products offered by Saturna Capital. This material should not be construed as an offer to sell or the solicitation of an offer to buy any security in any jurisdiction where such an offer or solicitation would be illegal. We do not provide tax, accounting, or legal advice to our clients and all investors are advised to consult with their tax, accounting, or legal advisors regarding any potential investment. Investors should not assume that investments in the securities and or sectors described were or will be profitable. This podcast is prepared based on information Saturna Capital deems reliable. However, Saturna Capital does not warrant the accuracy or completeness of the information. Investors should consult with a financial advisor prior to making an investment decision. The views and information discussed in this commentary are at a specific point in time, are subject to change, and may not reflect the views of the firm as a whole. All material presented in this publication, unless specifically indicated otherwise, is under copyright to Saturna. No part of this publication may be altered in any way copied or distributed without the prior express written permission of Saturna Capital. To the extent that it includes references to securities, those references do not constitute a recommendation to buy, sell, or hold such security, and the information may not be current. The Amana Funds do not hold securities of any of the companies mentioned.